Thanks, everyone, uh, for having me today. Uh, I, I would just underscore your point. It is really impeccable timing. Uh, when you booked me back in March or April, little did we know that by the time I got here, we would have China devalue their currency, Brazil on the really the brink of a crisis, which I'll, I'll detail, throw in a peace agreement with Iran. There's, there's a lot going on. So incredible foresight. You had the crystal ball to book me today. Um, no shortage of topics to touch on. We can discuss each and, and all of those um, along with a few others. I've been doing my uh, entire investment career in emerging market corporate debt. I've been doing that a little over 10 years. Um, I've been to had the opportunity to go to 70 countries, see a lot of sides of these countries, um, both the affluent side and the less affluent side. And I think that's important to help understand some of the political dynamics in those countries. And we can talk about each and each and every one of those elements. But to begin, uh, I would first frame the discussion in the context of this first chart. It's the scariest chart I'm going to show you. And it's one that I think helps frame a lot of the concerns I get from my clients in the asset class and other constituents in our community. So let me walk you through it. In the last 10 years, you can see the net issuance of bonds in US dollars. That big gray block on the left hand side was the securitized credit crisis. So a lot of securitized debt. It was over 75% of credit supply in the dollar market. And we saw the consequences of that. And I think if I tie up, this is even a broader theme than emerging markets that extends into high yield credit and investment grade bonds. Look at the right hand side of the chart. So today, over 95% of net credit supply is coming from corporate credit. And my market, the emerging corporate space, is, is one, por one portion of that. That's the orange bar on top. So a lot of folks ask, is, is this a bubble? Usually equity investors, we love those charts as equity investors that go up and to the right. That means market cap is increasing. And I think the trend in our community towards passive investment really reinforces some negative behavior in the bond market. If Apple makes a great product, I'm sure I own three of them, that's great. That increases their market cap and more passive money rewards an excellent company. Now think about my market. Petrobras issues more debt, gets more leverage, and then gets rewarded with more capital flow. So you have this perversion of the fixed income market and it really aggravates the cycle when credit fundamentals turn. It's not just an, er an energy comment, it, it extends more broadly <coughs> as a theme throughout. So the million dollar question, is this a bubble? We're, we're gonna be talking about a lot of the risks in this asset class, but this is the million dollar question to get right. I'm gonna be addressing a lot of idiosyncratic risks, but my assessment of those idiosyncratic risks doesn't matter if we're walking into a very significant credit bubble and a credit pulse. There is some good news. I'm going to argue, at least to you, that the emerging corporate space is not a bubble. And I think you have to put the leverage ultimately in context. So a fairly complicated chart, and I'll narrate you through it. This is the 20 largest countries that I invest in. And it breaks down where is the corporate credit to these companies sourced from. So let's steer your eyes towards China on the very far left. That big gray block on top, that's over 70% of the credit to Chinese companies comes from Chinese banks. So a Chinese state bank lending to a China SOE. That little green bar beneath it is the credit coming from China's own bond market. I think one of the key reforms in emerging markets is that they all have their own bond markets now. They don't necessarily need me to finance their capital expenditure. The next bar below it is the international bank claim, so the cross-border lending of banks. And then that very tiny blue sliver on the bottom is me. So that entire big chart I showed you, it sums up to a trillion and a half dollars of emerging corporate bond issuance. It counts for 5% of the total corporate debt outstanding. So when people characterize this as a bubble, they're talking about a market that's gone from 2% of the debt outstanding to 5% of the debt outstanding. And I think it's important to take that leverage in context. You can't just look at a fraction of the leverage, you have to look at the total leverage and understand the nature of that. 
So I'm going to argue that as I go on and discuss these risks, that they're idiosyncratic risks, that we're not walking into a credit bubble, that you can stock pick and choose investments around this. Just one more comment to, to put this in context. I talked about how emerging credit is a big source of bond supply. It's also, and we all know this, a big source of bond yield. So developed markets along the bottom, we have lengthening duration and lower yields. So investors are being asked to wait longer for less. And really, where's the yield opportunity today with moderate duration? It's in emerging markets or high yield. I can also speak to high yield to an extent if, if you have some questions. Um, because I do work with my colleagues in that area. I'm going to flash forward straight to the point. I think to, to understand this opportunity to assess those idiosyncratic risks, if we think buying these bonds at 6 to 8% may be a good idea, you have to understand what you're walking into. These are the key risks that I find in emerging markets. I'll talk about some of them. Um, if there are others that you want to address, feel free to, to, to do that for Q&A. And I think the first thing we need to focus on is growth. <clears throat> this concept of secular stagnation that's in the market. I had a client uh, ask me recently, she, she asked a very simple but a very astute question. She asked, is growth good for credit? A simple question, you would think the answer is yes, but as she dug into her thinking, every time we have growth, we build bubbles in some areas. So why should I own debt when you're in a strong period of growth? Shouldn't I only own debt and credit when you're in a period of deleveraging? And as I thought more about that, my, my response to her was ultimately that we typically begin emerging market conversations with growth because growth still is good for credit. Ultimately, what is my job? Today, I have 110 loans in 35 countries across the world. If my investors are going to get repaid, they're either going to get repaid through internal sources of free cash flow generation or the bond investment that I've made on their behalf is going to get refinanced. And it's really only in strong periods of growth that these companies are able to generate free cash flow and that credit conditions are sufficiently benign to allow refinancing. So ultimately, when I scour the world for opportunities, I do still look for growth. And if there's good news, it's that there is present still growth in emerging markets, as bad as the headlines seem. And this is the right-hand chart. So this is showing you the growth premium in emerging markets relative to developed markets. Pre-1998, emerging markets were more or less a, a, a basket case of, of disarray and, and, and debt relief and um, challenging dynamics. We had a, a really, uh, while some countries had growth in the early 90s, it was not really equitable growth. You had a lot of um, autocratic and military regime, so it was growth on behalf of a few, not necessarily a broad representation of emerging market population. Then you had a crisis, and in the 90s we reformed. That catalyzed this great growth boom, which was supported by commodities, five to six and a half percent growth premium in emerging markets over developed markets. And today, at least what the IMF is telling you in these projections is 2015 to 16, is the worst of the inflection point. We're currently witnessing the trough of that growth differential in EM versus DM. But the point is that while we may not be in the boom years, there is still growth. And the left-hand chart just reinforces there's a big delta. The, the whole concept of emerging markets to me, in some cases, is quite ridiculous. Why do we basket China and Brazil and Nigeria and Angola in the same, in the same strategy? They're completely different countries with completely different dynamics. I have 72 countries that I could invest in. <coughs> I choose to invest in 35 because I think there's opportunities there. And you can see the gray bar on this chart. This is showing the relative growth difference between the BRICS, over 10 percentage points between the worst and best performing large emerging market economy. We've never seen relative growth differentials like that in the past. So I think, again, this is not a, 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 a basket of uncontrollable risks. It's, it's a basket of idiosyncratic risks. So. Let's take one country as an example. Let's take Indonesia. Indonesia has a GDP per capita of about $2,500 and one of the most fa favorable demographic setups that you have in the world. On autopilot, this country can grow 5 5.5%. Now let's add in the fact that we have the most reform-minded president in President Jokowi since Indonesia became a democracy. If you look at the island of Java alone, the island has 140 million people, 
That's the population of Russia living in a land that's the size of Greece with the infrastructure of ancient Greece. It is, <laughs> I, if, of, of all the cities I go to in Jakarta, I have the most trouble actually getting meetings in. I can, in an 11 to 12 hour workday, I can usually do four meetings in Jakarta. The congestion from the ports to the restaurants to the hotels is, every city complains about their traffic. I will guarantee you it is nowhere worse, maybe outside of Lagos, than Jakarta. Now think about the reforms that President Jokowi is doing. Port congestion alone, he is, uh, I'm helping to finance this uh, in, in our strategies. He's expanding the port capacity. 140 million people share one half the port capacity that the UAE has. The UAE is 9 million people. So imagine the growth that you could unlock just by clearing that congestion and add on what he's doing in rail and other public infrastructure. You can take a five, five and a half percent steady state growth country and add 100 basis points to its potential growth through these infrastructure and other related reforms. We all know the miracle of compound interest. There's also a miracle of compound growth. That's how you go from a lower income country to a middle income country and a middle income country to be those few graduates that actually go to a high income country like Korea. You need reform and you need compound growth. And ultimately where I'm allocating capital in this really rough environment at a high level are in countries where I find a reform pulse. And I'm happy to chat about these individually Indonesia's one, India's another, that's fairly consensus, Mexico, and my largest overweight in China, which I can already tell uh, tends to attract smirks, and I know it will and should, and I'm happy to detail that, uh, but there's probably the most underappreciated reform agenda in China today relative to any other country. We love to, we love to criticize China as a currency manipulator 10 years ago, and now they're actually free-floating their currency and we criticize them again. But let's take it in the context that Xi Jinping is actually doing the most significant set of reforms since Deng Xiaoping back in, in the late 90s. I'll detail a lot more China. It's worth its own um, standalone, standalone discussion to, to evaluate those risks. But the key takeaway here is, yes, there's low growth, but we can find pockets of regrowth that are still out there. And we can allocate our capital more towards we, where we find positive inflection points of reform. In a way, it's a little too early for me to say this, but I may come to you in a year or two and talk about the second great generation of emerging market reforms. The first great generation was back in the 90s that catalyzed this period. And sometimes, honestly, it takes a good crisis to catalyze reforms. Governments don't reform when things are good. And I think we're in this period, the four countries that I mentioned, if Brazil can tip over into a reform camp, you have over half of emerging market GDP implementing significant economic reforms. And you typically want to be focused on capturing that in the early stage of development because the market prices it in well before the reforms are actually realized. India is a great example of that. It's already traded up so significantly, but President Modi, for all his efforts, still has not been able to accomplish a lot yet. That's growth. I'm going to talk secondly just about the commodity price decline. This is probably the key area where a lot of emerging market countries went wrong. This chart is just showing you the spread widening for commodity uh, exporting countries on the right hand side. You can see Venezuela sticking out. And this is plotted against the trade balance and the impact on the trade balance from negative oil. So Venezuela in the bottom right, basically the biggest loser in our market. 90% of their exports are energy, a classic case of Dutch disease. They do nothing else competitively. And on top of that, they have probably the most corrupt oil extracting company in the world in Petabesa, which just feeds money into the oligarchy of Venezuela. So there's a reason those bonds trade at 35 cents on the dollar. The good news on this chart is the little blue dot in the middle that says the group GDP average. On balance, the countries that I invest in tend to export crude and import refined. So actually negative oil or, or falling oil prices have a pretty mixed impact on these countries. And countries like India on the far left are key beneficiaries. The key message to me though on this chart is the losers lose, so Venezuela, more than you'll gain for the beneficiaries in India. So you're going to lose more money in Venezuela than you'll make in India. So while EM on the whole is mixed, it's probably a net negative, even just from the correlation of risk sentiment to the extent that you get another leg down in commodities. So I can talk about 
the commodity price view separately. And back to my earlier point, why this is the biggest thing that emerging market countries got wrong. I've been traveling to Russia for 10 years. I've been meeting Russian policymakers for 10 years. And for 10 years, every single year, they tell me we are going to diversify our economy away from oil. <laughs> now let's actually look at the report card of what they've done in that period. They nationalized UCOS in 2004. They forced TNKBP to sell its assets to Rosneft in 2012. They seized uh, Boschneft, which is another large oil producer in the country last year. So since their very messy privatization after Gorbachev in the 90s, the state ownership of Russia's extractive sector has gone from 20% to 70%. At the same time that they tell all of their foreign investors about their dreams of a Silicon Valley in Russia, so on and so forth. So when I talk about reformers in emerging markets, you can rank maybe next to Saudi Arabia, Russia is pretty close to dead last. So where is my incremental capital flow going to be rewarded? Capital flow is more discriminating. I'll find opportunities in Russia. There still are some very good companies, but on the whole, this isn't a government that's putting its country in a position to succeed. Fed. Your guess is as good as mine. I, you know, I'm, I'm the emerging market credit guy. I'll tell you, um, my, you, you should discount my Fed view because I'm the emerging market credit guy. But at least what I'm prepared, I, I've, I have nothing in my strategy that is really impacted by this. I think, frankly, once the Fed moves, there's a broad consensus about what terminal rates are. We're in a pretty low inflation world. It's tough to get terminal cumulative rates beyond 3%. And at that point, once the Fed moves, I'll say first quarter of next year, but the risk is skewed to the downside to the extent that we get a deceleration of Chinese growth. The Fed is just, unlike Greenspan, we've introduced this variable of data dependency, so it's, that's the inherent uncertainty. Once the Fed moves, China becomes basically the show. That is the key global macroeconomic driver, because I think there's a consensus on when the Fed moves, and I would just encourage everyone in your own allocation to become more of a student of Chinese monetary policy, of Chinese fiscal policy, bring in external experts to educate you on that. Because once the Fed moves, I really think that's going to be front and center in terms of the key global driver for a lot of what we do in our community. The key issue for emerging markets, though, is if I just bring it back to my asset class. On the left-hand side, you've probably seen this chart before. But it shows you a growing bond market on the right, that's the orange line, and shrinking dealer inventory on the left. So. Thank you, global financial crisis. You've made my job a lot harder because when I have outflows, I can't sell bonds at the prices I want. It's just a structural gap. It's a permanent condition of fixed income as a consequence of regulation. And platforms just need to adapt to that new reality. So how do we do that? Enterprise risk management. Be very prudent about your capacity. You have to close shop when you're managing too much. Portfolio risk management. I can walk through a number of techniques that I do to close liquidity gaps. It's different for a retail product versus an institutional product. And then lastly, credit underwriting. You have to get it right when you underwrite the bond, because if you get it wrong, the market is completely one way. And especially in emerging markets, our judicial integrity, if you actually own a defaulted credit, it really, um, the recovery values are quite poor, and I can chat about some detail on that. Question in the back. Do you have a way to get exposure when you when you don't want to necessarily pick it? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, there's a very immature derivatives market in emerging market credit. Um, I could use a sovereign CDX, which basically has 30% of its credit spread dictated by Venezuela. I don't really want to own Venezuela, so I'm not, no, I'm not going to take that position. I could do a high yield CDX, which is about a 0.65 long term correlation to emerging markets. That's a decent way to do it. But I think what we do first is just get our capacity right. I don't feel like I'm in a position where I'm managing too much. So if my capacity number is okay, I can actually buy cash bonds. 99% of what I intend to do is buy cash bonds versus derivatives. Um, you can be more active in derivatives outside of emerging markets. It's a much broader palette and toolkit. But um, for EM, it's, it's a tough go.
feel free to cut, um, cut me off anytime you want. I, I was going to save time at the end, but if there's something, please. I wouldn't categorize Angola and Nigeria as a frontier, just frontier markets. Yep. Yep. You consider them emerging, and I guess it's so from a definitional, uh, definitional perspective, um, emerging markets includes Angola, Nigeria, all the frontiers, and then frontiers are a subset of emerging markets. So it, in a way, they share both labels. I would say frontier credit is an area that we're cyclically pretty cautious on, um, and it's understandable. Unfortunately, it's a lot of commodity extractive countries. It's a lot of countries that, frankly, don't have a repayments culture. I haven't seen a bond repaid in Mongolia yet, but people have lent them a lot of money. So let's see kind of how the Ulaanbaatar political regime handles it when, when coal prices are down. Um, I think you have to earn your way up in a portfolio, even if it's an attractive, liquidity adjusted, so on and so forth. If you don't have a repayments culture, then you're going to be a smaller position. You have to earn your right up in a strategy. So. Especially frontier corporate credit, um, you can do a little bit on the sovereign side, um, but in frontier corporates, that's our, our least liquid bucket that's available to us. Please. What's your view of the what's going to happen to the emerging market credit when the Fed starts to raise interest rates? You were alluding to that, but I think there was uh, there was a time a few months ago when we were just on the verge of raising twenty five basis. Yep. So if we were going to do one or two raises, what do you think is going to happen to the credit? And also, could you talk about dollar denominated versus local currency bonds? Yes. Which you yep. So those, those two questions actually go quite well together. Um, let's put this in, in context. Today, I'm negative on emerging markets. And I think the, the best way to, and that's interesting for an emerging market PM to stand in front of you and say, but you have to call it like it is. I think when you, when you structure an answer to that question, I'll, I'll answer it the way I answer it to my, my, my internal counterparty. So I'm, one of the hats I wear is on T. Rowe Price's multi-sector bond strategies. They don't have to own emerging markets. They can if I find it interesting. And each of the asset class sponsors, myself included, rates their asset class on a scale of one to five. One is a strong buy, five is a strong sell. So in May of this year, we downgraded both emerging market corporate credit and emerging market sovereign credit to a four. Our multi-sector strategies, their peak exposure to emerging markets is 25%, today it's 5%. But I will say, to the extent that we are focused on reform-oriented countries, I am beginning to unwind that trade. But where I'm unwinding it, where I'm adding to emerging markets is firstly in the sovereign asset class, where you do have more liquidity. So I personally think the first Fed hike is the most important inflection point. You're right that there could be subsequent hikes thereafter. Personally, I feel like there's more consensus on the cumulative path versus the initial date. But into that first Fed hike, and certainly after would be the more tangible inflection point of when to add to emerging markets. I feel like we're closer to the point of macroeconomic capitulation on negativity. But the first leg in, in case I'm wrong, I can be wrong, or I could be too early, it would be in sovereign debt, because it's significantly more liquid. And what I'm ultimately making, I haven't talked about spreads yet, any allocation today to the sovereign space, it's really a valuation-centered thesis. I don't have a lot of fundamentally positive inflection points that I can point you towards. And anytime you have a fundamentally or, or, or technically grounded thesis, you need to be careful, because you're more likely to be wrong. Valuations are a moving target, and they can clearly overshoot. So that's why you want to time your entry first in a liquid asset class like emerging sovereigns, and then if and when you get more fundamental grounding on emerging corporates, that would be my second entry point. Emerging local. How many in this room think about emerging local from a dollar-funded perspective, ID, so, so, i.e. Um, US dollar BRL or US dollar IDR? I'll raise my hand and say I do. Are most of you dollar-funded and thinking about your local allocation? I get a general consensus of yes. And unfortunately, despite four years of terrible performance, the harsh reality is that it doesn't matter what EM currencies do against the dollar. Because the reforms that I talked about in the 90s fixed the original sin of this asset class. 
The original sin of this asset class was borrowing in foreign currency and only having local currency revenues to repay it, and we had a crisis in the 90s. Think about what we've done since the late 90s. We've introduced independent central banks that target inflation. We've de-dollarized our banking sector. So Turkey, in 2001, 80% of the credit they lent into the country was dollar denominated. Today it's 20. We have fiscal regimes that target, and outside of Brazil, generally we have pretty good fiscal rules in emerging markets. FX reserves are over 15 trillion in emerging. So it, it is a completely fundamentally different emerging market balance sheet. I think if you had had 70% BRL depreciation in 2001 against the dollar, you would have had, and you did have, hyperinflation, bank runs, unemployment. You've had about 50% median emerging market currency depreciation, and life is substantially unchanged. So if you're thinking about emerging market currencies, you have to think about it from the policymaker's hat. There's no real reason the BRL can't go to four or five or four and a, or five and a half. There's no natural resistance level. If you think about, think about it in this context, if the S&P 500 was down 20% next month, the Fed is gonna do something because there's a wealth effect and they care. If the BRL is down 20% next month, it unfortunately doesn't matter. And that's sort of the, the context of that, that discussion. So when you're looking at emerging market local currencies, and I challenge myself to do this as well, you have to remove yourself from a dollar funded mindset because that's not what the policymakers think. You have to think about it more on a real effective exchange rate basis. Who are my trading counterparties? Basically no one, maybe outside of Mexico, trades, with the U trades against the US. So it's more how is my currency doing versus my peers. And the key thing that's changed is a regime change in the RMB. That was not a factor when we booked this meeting in March or April. If the RMB, on our view, a base case of a six to 8% cumulative depreciation in 24 months, every other Asia FX is gonna depreciate as a beta to that. And it's their currency, it's their country that can do what they want with it. And they should, frankly, devalue to gain competitiveness. They're losing export share to Vietnam, they're losing export share to Mexico. So I think you have, everyone's been thinking about it from a dollar funded Fed perspective, and I think it's more about a real effective exchange rate, China funded perspective. And so when I go back into emerging markets, I think local, I can be up to 10% local in my dollar credit strategy, I've been at zero the last four years, and I don't have any near term intentions to change that. I was asking from the point of view of the US Yep. 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 So uh, to contextualize it, a uh, hundred percent of my market is dollar credit. So you take on country risk, you take on corporate credit risk, you take on liquidity risk. Risk. But currency is not one of the elements that you'll have. Um, if you think about the narration of the history of this asset class, we began with the Brady Plan. We moved to emerging sovereign bonds, emerging local sovereign bonds, emerging dollar corporates. That's my asset class. We will eventually have an emerging local currency corporate market, but there's not really demand for it today. So I'd say to the extent that you're worried about currencies, it has an impact on your EM local allocation, it has an impact on your EM equity allocation if you're a dollar funded investor. But for the dollar credit in sovereign and corporate space, it's a, it's a tertiary versus a primary fact, uh, consideration. Any other questions on the material so far? Great. I've been pretty negative so far. I'm gonna turn positive, I promise. So the USD strength, actually you beat me to the topic, thank you. We just basically touched on that point. I think that the key matter here is that against the dollar at least, there's no key floor to emerging currencies. And I would just challenge everyone to kind of think about this more on a, a China-centered and real effective exchange rate basis. Contingent liabilities. This is really the last risk that I plan to speak on and then just really open it up to country specific or asset class specific questions. I think this is an area that a lot of people miss. Everyone's gonna show you a chart about, uh, this is basically uh, the debt issued by state owned enterprises in emerging markets. So not sovereign guaranteed debt, but debt that 
maybe is implied with respect to a guarantee. It's showing you against a couple of different indices, but the key line is the one on the bottom. It's gone from about 8% of the debt outstanding to over 30% of the debt outstanding in the last 10 years. So a third of the debt in my market is issued by state-owned enterprises. It has an implied but not an actual guarantee. And it goes back to, these are really big companies, Petrobras, Pedavesa, passive management flow, we're gonna allocate capital to big capital structures. If anything goes wrong, the government will support it, or will they? And I think that's sort of the key thing that our market is struggling with. We've created a very big net of contingent liabilities, and when you have fiscal belt tightening, that's typically when the contingent liability is realized, and so where does the government cut the cord? I think that's ultimately what our market's trying to negotiate through. There's a reason that Brazil yields 6% and Petrobras yields 12%. It used to be a 100 basis point difference, now it's completely unanchored because the market is doubting the willingness and ability of Brazil to support its contingent liability. And you're gonna lose a lot of money waiting for the check to clear. I met Petrobras 10 days ago. I do think the check will clear. Um, ultimately, they're gonna recapitalize the company, but there's gonna to have to be a lot of pain to force them to do that given all the other fiscal considerations in the market. And think about that for a minute. When I was, when I was in Brazil, uh, it, this goes back to the theme of put yourself in the policymaker's shoe, or in, in, in the policymaker's shoes. When I was in Brazil, I went to one of the favelas, so that's one of the thousand very poor communities in Brazil, and I went to one that was, it was on my free day. I went to one that I felt comfortable going into. This has been demilitarized. Um, it has a UPP police force at the top of it watching down, and they've rooted the drug trade out. But it's awful. Brazil, the last country in the world to end slavery, a legacy of discrimination and wealth inequality, maybe next to India and Southeast Asia, probably the greatest inequality of a country that I've been to. You have crumbling infrastructure, open sewage, just horrible conditions, no schools or hospitals. So think about if you're the PT party, and in Brazil, that's the Dilma Rousseff and Lula party, and you were elected, you were elected how? Well, your social expenditures went from 60% of your revenues to 80. So you donated a lot of money. You brought a lot of people out of poverty. You did a lot of really good things. But now oil prices are down 50% and you need to tighten your fiscal belt. How do you go into that community and actually cut funding when inflation is skyrocketing and unemployment is increasing and crime has rarely been as bad in Rio de Janeiro as it is in the last 15 years? People of our means in Rio de Janeiro own bulletproof cars. A fully equipped Toyota Corolla with armor costs you $75,000 after import taxes and armor. So it's, it's a really rough situation for the government. We, we like to think it's so easy from the US, oh, the Brazil needs to adjust fiscally. But think about trying to adjust fiscally and stay in power with the constituency that elected you. So it's, it's not a slam dunk that all these contingent liabilities are gonna be supported. The government has to cut the cord somewhere uh, this is not a Brazil theme, this is a global theme. I think ultimately, from my experience in this market, the two sectors that get supported are number one, your banks. We've seen that in our country. If you don't support your banks, you have a lot of other issues. It's a business model that inherently by its nature has 20 turns of leverage on it. So you always support the banks. And it's also relatively cheap to support the banks because they can funny accounting and delay their provisions and all that. Um, <laughs> The second thing you support is ultimately your extractive sector because it's a revenue producer for the country. Uh, and then third on the list, you will support your utilities because you need to keep the lights on. And then it's pretty open. There's a lot of other contingent liabilities out there where the market just assumes that there's gonna be support. And I think unfortunately, a, a passive versus fundamental trend in our market reinforces that, that passive capital allocation and has created that contingent liability. So I think as that unwinds, it's one of the key themes that I'm watching for in this market. So I'm, I'm gonna pause there and just completely open up to any, any questions that are on mind. I think the, the key messaging is we are today still negative on emerging markets, have been for a period of time, but starting to unwind that. And no one's ever gonna call the top of the market to the day. I think you wanna be better to be a little early than a little late. 
because I think you'll have a fairly material correction in a short period of time. Um, and I would, I would start that entry in more liquid asset classes where if you're wrong for some externality or some um, endogenous reason, at least in the sovereign market, you can change your mind relatively easily. Whereas the corporate market, you should consider that more of a long-term illiquid allocation. So I'll pause there and please fire away with questions. There's one, two, and three, and four. You've alluded to this a little bit, but how would you quantify the haves and the have nots in Latin America? Mm -hmm. So um, you can, the easiest way to do it is the, the Gini coefficient, Mexico, Brazil, uh, among countries like South Africa, have some of the highest Gini coefficients in the world. It's a scale of zero to 100. They're around 65, 62. And unfortunately, it's when we talk about, I'm talking about reforms in these countries. So <coughs> let's talk about the miracle of reforms under Modi in India. Well, there's a billion people in India, and I would suspect that less than 250 million will experience any tangible benefit from the reforms that we're talking about. So these economies are still, and will be for another generation, very, very divided, and that creates a lot of social issues. The countries where I worry more about are ones where you have a lot of male youth unemployment. Uh, I think that tends to seed distress. I'm Arab American by background, so I'm very familiar with the Middle East. We all know the issues in the Middle East. The biggest issue in the Middle East is that there's a lot of male youth unemployment. So I tend to, if, if there's not a reform, then there's probably some of the most worst reform-oriented governments that are out there, uh, if they even have a government. So I tend to, uh, be very wary of allocating capital into countries where you don't have reform momentum and you have a lot of youth male unemployment. Still, and fortunately or unfortunately, I'm, I'm an investor first and foremost versus a, a nonprofit, so I, I follow these issues because I think it, it matters. You need to be a responsible steward of, of capital and understand the countries that you're investing in. Mexico, the drug, the, the drug trade is still the second biggest industry in Mexico is oil, but it's a shadow part of the economy and it doesn't, it's not gonna impact me making or losing money on a telecommunications credit. So I, I look at it, I pay attention to it. I think it's important to understand the countries that you're investing in. But for a lot of my micro decisions, it doesn't necessarily impact that unless it gets so bad that you have a period of social stress and the whole country becomes more vulnerable. So I hope that answers, answers the question. Uh, two is here, three and four. But did you have a question as well? Yes. Quick question, quick answer. Will yep. the Olympics be a disaster? So, um, <laughs> they, they'll get it done. Um, oh, sorry about that, thank you. The, will Rio get the Olympics done? Um, I was there, I drove by, I didn't go inside, but drove by the stadium construction. The, the key issue that's delayed them is part of this corruption graft probe They've jailed uh, the CEOs of three of the five largest engineering and construction companies who are contracted to execute that. So they'll get it done. It's going to be a little messy, but it's so important for the country. Um, I heard a rumor, I don't know if it's true, that London has been told to be on call in case Brazil can't get it done. But that gives you sort of context about the concern. The key issue is going to be the water sports, because if you go to the bay in Rio where they plan to do that, it is. It's filth. It's horribly the sanitation issues I mentioned on the hills just flow down to the water. So it's they're working on it, but um, it's expensive, and we're we're cutting the budget. Uh, the third was four, and then I had a five over here. Can you talk a little bit about? I know you're on the bond side, but emerging market bonds and equities kind of flow near each other. Can you yep. talk to me about what you think is a better way for comparison of exposures to? versus equities in emerging markets, timing, turmoil, volatility? Yep, so uh, near-term view, I'd be more positive on bonds. Long-term view, I'd be more positive on equities um, is the short answer to contextualize that. The near-term view, I think the key issue with emerging equities is the currency component. And I just kind of walked you through my thesis on, especially as a dollar-funded basis. Um, the, the issue with the currency and, and, and the fact that I mentioned no one's going to catch that falling knife the volatility is just so significant. So I, I tend to think about things on a sharp basis versus an absolute basis. And yes, there's interesting nominal return potential, but the volatility that you're gonna experience in the meantime is what, what edges my concern. But long-term, I mean, the, the growth in these countries that I mentioned, 
yeah, I, I personally, in my own PA, own more EM equities than EM debt for context. But I think for my trade and my near-term view, um, the currency issue would keep me more biased towards bonds. Uh, I had here so and then there. Uh, Friday's Number. Yep. Seeing some softness in the dollar, right? rebounding uh, energy, rebounding uh, emerging market equity. Yep. Uh, currency seem to be extreme. Yep. Maybe uh, time for a bounce. Is it a short-term reprieve or is it a start of a trend? Yep. Uh, in your opinion, uh, especially with the Fed's maybe on hold for a little longer. Yep. And what would cause you to be? You take that next incremental step from being marginally more positive to really excited and optimistic. Yep, uh, great, great questions. Uh, especially the employment number, I think, surprised everyone in the context of it was just a bad data print. Um, maybe one is too soon to call a trend. Personally, I'm viewing that, and speaking with my U.S. economists, I'm viewing that as transient versus the inflection point. So I'm not necessarily adding a lot of risk into this. I feel like I positioned in a fairly risk off mode going into that period. So I'm, maybe in the last 10 days, I feel a little bit off sides. But I think emerging markets is not about the Fed. It's not about the US. It's about our own endogenous issues that we have to work through the countries. Um, and to, to point you to the catalyst that I'm actually looking for, the second part of your question is, Brazil alone has been 55% of the spread widening in my market since May. So I think if I were to look for any country where I need to find the first catalyst, Brazil would be near term first and China is always going to be the most important. But for Brazil, the specific catalyst I'm looking for, 50% of their fiscal adjustment, so will Brazil reform or not, 50% of their adjustment comes from one tax, the CPMF tax, it's a financial transactions tax. We'll find out in the first quarter of next year if they can pass it under the prior two administrations has failed. If they do not get that tax done and you have a president with 7% popularity, Brazil will go completely unanchored because people will begin to doubt already the reforms that they've failed to deliver on. So if there's a lot of eggs in one basket. Uh, that's why she shook up Dilma Rousseff, shook up her cabinet, added a lot of opposition members, gave them big budget spending ministries like health so they feel empowered. She's trying to get them on her side. But it's not quite a coin flip. It's, it's our base case that it gets done, but there's a real risk that it doesn't get done. So I'd say if there's a country-specific catalyst, if that happens, you can basically add Brazil. It'll reinvigorate uh, the finance minister, or at least give him more political capital. You can put Brazil into my reformers camp. And all of a sudden, I have 50% of emerging markets GDP in reform camp. That's with a three-year, four-year, five-year view, that's a really big deal. So I would be very likely to be uh, adding emerging markets if I get more certainty. Usually news, good or bad, Brazil just has the most active press in the world. So it'll be on a blog somewhere in Sao Paulo before it happens that you know this, the politicians are gonna get this done. Um, but that's something I'm spending a lot of time on. Near-term transient, long-term, it's about our own endogenous issues, not, not the Fed. I had a question here and then one there. You haven't talked at all about the maturity spectrum that you mm -hmm. focus on or invest in, or yep. is this a market that is so individually uh, security driven that you know you're buying the federal cost bonds and it doesn't make any difference whether it's a five year or fifteen year or thirty five year? Yep, uh, I'd say we score our investments uh, on a one year and three year time horizon. Uh, because of the illiquidity in my market, I tend to bias more towards the three-year side. I don't want to turn over a lot because it's expensive to turn over. I pay, depending on bond, one and a half to two points for a high-yield bond to turn it over. So I usually want to allocate capital and stick with it. And if it's profitable, then monetize it. But I need to have a certain bar of materiality on that, that profit. The reason I also build in a one-year view, if you look at the last nine months, if you bought the Russia average and sold the Brazil average in January, you would have a 35% performance gap in a bond fund that is huge, that is very, very significant. And that's not minor countries. These are our second and third largest markets, respectfully. So I 
while I bias long term, I'm a long term investor, I do need to be aware of these sort of more tactical six month and one year inflection points. But I don't own anything in my strategy that I wouldn't be comfortable owning in three years. It's just more how I scale that bet that's informed by the one year view. I had a question here. Um, so you said that um, the most important things for the future of a, a, a emerging market is um, reform momentum, mm -hmm. I guess, um, and then also male youth unemployment. Maybe there's a third factor like that that um, you can measure. But for the country, you also said that the countries that have the most going for them, uh, the two that you mentioned were Indonesia, mm -hmm. which has not been recognized, that reform has not been recognized, and India, whose reform momentum has been recognized, mm -hmm. but you mentioned China yep. as one that has not maybe gotten as much recognition as it yep. needs. But if you were to kind of rank countries, individual countries, by reform momentum, whether recognized or not, Mm -hmm. What would be your top sort of five countries? Yep, so I'll, I'll rank them shortly, but just for context, any one, I'll say, unit of reform in China is worth 10 times a unit of reform anywhere else. So I'm going to rank China third, but it's still the most important. So first would be India, and that's very, very consensus. Um, and I would own more India if it wasn't so priced in. Second would be Mexico. And the reason I would rank uh, Indonesia fourth, there's so much latent potential, but unlike an autocracy like China or small party systems in the other uh, two countries, um, or at least a more of a, a base that Modi has, Indonesia has the most fractured politics in East Asia. You have basically 11 relevant political parties. So he's, he's stitching together a coalition. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. Um, the other issue is that he's, frankly, a really honest guy. And politicians in Indonesia aren't usually that honest. So I think the people in his coalition that he needs to work with him, normally they would get paid and he's not paying them. So it's, it's, there's a lot of potential. It's just tough to, for him as a political outsider coming in to execute that. So I'm, I'm, I'm overweight Indonesia, but its reform prospects are just a little bit more tenuous. I, I always prefer blindly, I, I'd, I'd rather uh, invest in a country that has inclusive political institutions, so democracies, than extractive political institutions like an autocracy. But when you have to do a fiscal adjustment or reform, it's really, really difficult to do that in a democracy. Just, and we see it in our own country. How do you get people to agree on something at the federal level? Is there number five? Um, so Brazil is the one where it's, so I mean, there's uh, Romania, R Romania, Serbia, some of the Eastern European countries from their post-crisis period, even Hungary to an extent, but they're not, they're not going to move broader EM. But the ones that I mentioned, these are 150 million plus populations. These are really big, big countries. Question over here. So I met some friends from Mexico last week. Mm -hmm. And their comments on Mexico were with what's going on with the drug wars, and it's just become a lawless place. That the bad guys are the police, the bad guys are the government. The craft is so bad. What do you think the chances are for serious reform in Mexico yep. and the situation of it's, it's an incredibly complicated country. And I, I kind of alluded to this in the earlier question, too. It's northern Mexico. I think any EM country, and especially China, we have to focus on a regional level, not a national level. There is no China Inc., for example. Six provinces account for 85% of the slowdown in China. So it's not a national slowdown, it's a regional slowdown. The growth gap between Chinese provinces is 15 percentage points. Now I'll take that to Mexico. Northern Mexico is basically what Colombia was in the 90s. It's really, really bad. I don't own anything in northern Mexico. I own one company that has a cement plant in northern Mexico. But what I'm focused on is more other areas of Mexico that have convexity. So the reform agenda, I, he's probably going to fail on any sort of drug reforms because it's just too entrenched into the, the, the dark economy there. 
but he will succeed and has succeeded on telecom reform. He is succeeding on oil reform. Unfortunately, time given where oil prices are. But opening up the energy sector in Mexico for the first time in 80 years, that's, that's a really big deal. So I don't, while I worry about the drug trade, I think it's a regional issue and it doesn't impact the investments that I'm making in other parts of Mexico. But it, it concerns me as a steward of capital allocating. I, I, I always pay attention to that because I just think anytime you're, it, it's your responsibility as a foreign investor to pay attention to these issues. And, and when I have opportunities in my analysts to meet with policymakers in Mexico, we, we let them know this is troubling to us. I'm not pulling out my money today, but it's, we're not happy about this, so you need to contain it. I think that's our responsibility to do. One more question. What about the role of central bankers in uh, yep. these countries, in particular in India, that comes to mind, mm -hmm. just because he was University of Chicago finance yep. professor. So Rajan was, um, the, the data by India was not the day Modi was elected, it was the day that Rajan was appointed the central bank governor. And think about what India has done. Think, think about the, the poverty in that country. You can associate it with my earlier comments on Brazil and magnify it. There's a reason that you've had over 50 years since independence with a left-leaning government. <coughs> so think about, and basically one party, think about what a sea change this is in India. You've elected a center-right government in the most poverty-stricken country on earth. That's, that is a complete, you're gonna draw the line and call this a regime change. And the fact that you have a very credible central bank governor, they were dealing with credibility issues before he got there, that's another big deal. So the, the, the key takeaway on that is while one man or one woman can't necessarily make a difference in and of themselves, the market will begin to price in that sooner. So when Levy came as the finance minister of Brazil, very similar ideology to the, the folks that we just referenced, that was a really big deal. You had a left-leaning PT government that just did a bunch of social expenditures that I commented, hire a Chicago-trained conservative finance minister. That's that's a sea change in their political thinking. So what you have to do is, what our sovereign analysts do is research the backgrounds of these policy actors, understand what they are before they get promoted. You always need to know sort of the second tier of leadership in these countries because the roles tend to turn over relatively more frequently than they do in developed markets. Thank you. I'm out of time, but just ask questions on the side. So thank you.